Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graff, and this is episode number 10. Today we're going to be talking about CRISPR, and in particular how CRISPR can act as a, an acquired bacterial immune system. So there's a lot to go over. I'll try to dive right in. So bacteria need to have an immune system because they're constantly getting infected. They get infected with bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. And bacteriophages can be called just phages, and I probably refer to them as that throughout this talk. There are a lot of phages in this world. Uh, I wrote billions in all capital letters, but I crossed that out because that's not even close to how many bacteriophages there are. Uh, this is a four within a bunch of zeros, and in scientific notation it's four times ten to the thirtieth. So there's more than four times ten to the thirty thirtieth bacteriophages, and that's just talking about the phages that are in the ocean. Uh, bacteriophages are definitely on land, they're in you. Uh, wherever you have bacteria, you're going to find bacteriophages. So bacteria have defense mechanisms against phages because phages are generally bad for the bacteria's health. So uh, they want to they want to resist being infected with with these phages. Uh, in particular today we're going to talk about a specific bacteria called Streptococcus thermophilus and the reason that people studied this particular bacteria is that it's important to the dairy industry. So for your cheeses and, and yogurts this is a commonly used bacteria. Now if uh, you get a, a bacteriophage that inf contaminates your culture it could kill off most of the bacteria and, and you can see that that could be an economically a, a problem and pr production wise a problem for your for your yogurt company. So this study that I'm going to talk about today it was published I think in 2006, I'll have a link below, it is a study of scientists at Danisco, which is uh, kind of a large uh, dairy industry company. The thing about uh, this bacteria is that if you sequence a bunch of a bunch of strains of this bacteria and you line up their genomes and you say what's the same and what's different, what you're going to see is that almost the entire thing is the same. There's just very few areas where it's kind of hot spots for having variability between strains. One of these hot spots is the CRISPR loci. So these, uh, the, this study was a study of the CRISPR loci and basically what they did, fairly straightforward, they took the bacteria and then they added phage A or they took the bacteria and they added phage B. These have other names than A and B, but I just don't want to get into that. And then they added a, th a third condition, which was the bacteria, and then they added A plus B, so both, both types of phages. And what they did is they allowed the phages to kill the bacteria that were susceptible, and then eventually you end up back with bacteria that are resistant to the phages. So when they found their resistant bacteria, they went back in, isolated these bacteria, and sequenced this CRISPR loci. So I haven't explained the CRISPR loci yet, um, but I will now. So there are various components within a CRISPR system. One is CAS proteins. The CAS is short for CRISPR, associated genes. So these genes make proteins that are uh, just, they, they work with the, they work with the uh, CRISPR system and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's a leader sequence, at least in this uh, particular CRISPR system we're talking about. It's the sequence that pre that's preceding the spacer slash repeat array. So what do I mean by spacer and repeat array? Well, there are repeats in this CRISPR loci. So this is a repeated sequence that's found over and over and over. And these repeats are palindromic. And spacers are sequences that match the bacteriophage or plasmids, and then they're, which gives you a clue as to what they might want to do. And then they're variable among strains. So it's actually these spacers 
that give you the strain to strain differences. So this is a drawing of the, of the CRISPR system in uh, Streptococcus thermophilus. These, uh, these uh, genes that are, that are designated with these, these green boxes with an arrow, this tells you where the gene is and, and which direction the gene is orient, oriented on the, on the genome. And there are four CAS genes, uh, the CRISPR associated genes with this system. Then there's a leader sequence. And like I said, it comes right before this really interesting part, which the diamonds, the purple diamonds that I have, these are the repeat sequence. And these sequences are palindromic. And if you express a single strand of nucleic acid that's, uh, that has palindromic se sequence, it ends up folding up on itself and it can serve as kind of a handle for other proteins to grab onto. And then there's the spacers. The spacers here, I've labeled one, two, three, four, five, six. I think in the paper, their figure showed 32 spacers for this sequence, but it just wouldn't fit with my diagram. So these spacers, they're, they're uh, interesting because they, if you sequence them and look at their sequences, they match up with, with phages and, and plasmids. And um, when you go from one strain to the next, you tend to get new spacer sequences put on this end of the, of the array. So this array is going to be kind of the focal point of this study that I'm, that I'm going to talk about. So the, the study had four big findings. Uh, the first finding is that new spacers in resistant bacteria match A and B. So remember, they took bacteriophage and combined that with the bacteria, and then they waited for bacteria to become resistant to the phage. And when they sequenced, when they sequenced this portion of the genome of the bacteria, um, what they found is new spacer sequences, so these new orange boxes, were inserted uh, near the leader of the um, of the uh, array. Then, so that would suggest that these new sequences are somehow being used by the bacteria to attack the phage, and, and that underlies their resistance to the phage. Now, um, because other mutations could happen throughout the sequence of the bacteria, they just went in and artificially put in spacer sequences that match a phage. And when they did that, artificially adding these spacers with phage sequence, those bacteria were resistant to the phages that had those sequences. The third major finding was they, they interrupted a couple of the CRISPR-associated genes, CAS5 and CAS7. So that's shown here as CAS5 and here's CAS7. They're the two biggest genes in this array. CAS5, when they interrupted it, they created bacteria that weren't able to acquire spacers anymore. And when they interrupted CAS7, they created bacteria uh, that could not be uh, resistant to phage anymore, suggesting that CAS7 somehow works with the spacer sequence to uh, attack the phage. Now phages with mutations can evade detection. So if you, take, if you take a strain of bacteria that has a spacer that gives it resistance against a, a, a phage, you grow up that phage and you infect your bacteria, every once in a while you're going to be able to find some phages that are able to infect the bacteria and if you sequence those phages, the genome of the phage, so we're talking about the virus now, if you sequence the phage, then you end up with, you, you, you detect mutations within that sequence that matched up to the spacer sequence. So I know that's probably a lot to fit into a little video, but those, uh, those were huge findings. I did this uh, paper in a journal club back back when I was in graduate school, and it's the basis for the CRISPR-Cas9 that is um, lighting, lighting the molecular biology world on fire, really. Um, and at that time, I didn't think about how it could be used for genome editing, 
but in the next video we're going to talk about how